Better? Much better. All right. I thought I had turned it on. Okay, anyways. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, uh, a couple minutes delayed just for me to figure out how a computer actually works. Um, best conference to not know how technology works. Uh, so this is this is a fun little talk that uh, I'm really happy to be given. Um, I, it's kind of a shame uh, that Asshat, who plays Thor, first was in that Black Hat movie, and then he was in a Moby Dick movie as well. So no matter what, I can't seem to escape the... Uh, the, the peril of that particular actor. I forget his name at this moment, which shows you how much care I have. But in any event, it's a fun little talk about whaling. And uh, we're, we're going to take a look at some really, really interesting aspects. And I think one of the most exciting, and I can only say that as, as a consultant, as an investigator, um, if, if I'm a business, it's not an exciting campaign whatsoever. The uh, previous consultant in me does not let you get away with an agenda. Um, but uh, long story short, we're going to talk about some cool stuff. So um, that's really easy, easy summarized. Uh, for the most boring part in the presentation, I'll talk a little about who I am. Uh, my name is Matt Bromley. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm actually an incident response consultant, but that doesn't mean I don't constantly sit inside the, the, the red side of things and like to have a lot of fun. And the number of times my wife has looked at my home lab and asked me, what in the hell are you actually doing? Um, and me not being able to answer her either has been way too many times. Uh, we've got a little kid at home, so I'm raising a little hacker, I like to think. Um, she's already starting to think and figure things out um, and completely blowing my mind every single day, which is fun. Uh, I'm actually an up-and-coming SANS instructor as well, so I, I like to teach, I like to give back. And then I tweet and I blog, and I like to tell everyone, if anyone here has insomnia and you're looking to get a cure, just go and read some of the stuff I've written, and it'll knock you right out, so you'll be good to go. This is not meant to be a threat intel talk. Um, we're going to talk a little about it, but this is not meant to replace what should be a very comprehensive and well-designed threat intelligence. It's meant to track threats to an organization and then just have some fun with the metadata, right? We're investigators. You can't just give me a puzzle and I put all the pieces together and I'm done with it. I want to know what, what was in the picture, what happened, how was it put together. I'm also not going to try and sell you anything. Um, free and open source, please. The only way to go. Uh, I'm hoping that everyone walks out of here with a better toolkit than they walked in with. Um, if not, please come up and let me know. Hey, I knew all that stuff. This was completely boring, and I'll find a way to change it. I also do not know anything about recent awesome CEO changes at a company whose name rhymes with Nair Tai or anything like that. Um, if anyone here pays attention, some dude who we didn't want is out, and some other awesome dude who does a crazy stuff is in. So let's talk a little bit about why this matters. Why should I care about this particular campaign? Anyone here working for a business of some sort? Not a, is anyone here not a consultant? All right, so a couple. So some of you, your job is to, correct me if I'm wrong, protect your house, for lack of a better term. Okay, you have a house to protect. Why does this matter? January 2015, the FBI came out, and they started talking about these business email scams. And at that point in time, there was only about 2,000 victims and only about 215 million taken. So in 14 months, these attackers had successfully taken about 200 million. Not bad. Not bad at all. Not bad for a little more than a year's work. Dollar, dollar bill. I love it. Bring that money in. Fast forward to August 2015. The FBI updates their alert. Hey, guess what? These guys have actually stolen now closer to 800 million. Put on your math, within an eight-month time frame, that's close to $600 million. Now I really, really like my salary. Oh my gosh, okay, so these guys are pretty serious. They're able to take some money out of my wallet. Let's get even more serious. We had an alert come out beginning of April of this year. We're now up to 17,000 victims. And in that time frame, we've got $2.3 billion stolen. In a six-month time frame, $1.5 billion stolen from these businesses. Malware that targets Swift is cool, but uh, 1.5 billion is a little more sexy than 9 million. So, uh, you know, you can keep your malware and have fun with your zero days and your persistent access. I'm just going to email one PDF and walk out with a billion dollars. We need to care. We need to be aware of what these guys are doing because guess what? Why did well, anyone here know why ransomware is so prolific? Because it works. If anyone saw Dave talking, what I mean, to be hired to pay bitcoins for an agency only proves one thing. It works. They're ready to pay, and the attackers are making a ton of money. I'm actually not sure what happened with TeslaCrypt, why they were like, you know what, forget it. Because everyone else, or some ransom were up to like version 9 and 10. It's like, just rewrite the code and move on. Um, but these guys apologized and gave out the source and gave out the master key. But in any event, it's making a lot of money, so why stop? If you're making a lot of money, you're not going to stop. Guess what? Anyone here who's got to protect a house or help someone else protect a house, this is coming. It's on your way if it hasn't happened already. In fact, and I really hope this doesn't happen in this room, but I gave this talk at a B-Sides event earlier, and I had three people come up to me afterwards and be like, hey, that actually happened to me. Um, I didn't know this happened. I was like, dude, don't tell me publicly you've just lost a couple hundred grand for your organization, or your organization lost that. 
hopefully they weren't the people who actually got targeted and, and thus fell victim to it. So we know why we should care. It's a lot of money walking out the door. Um, I'm assuming that there's some towns in some western parts of Africa that have like ridiculous cars and houses and everything floating around, and we'll talk about attribution in just a little bit. But that being said, let's look at a little bit of what these look like. So I call them whaling because of their targets. They're not necessarily whaling because our approach and our goals are a little bit different. But what is a, what is a, as opposed to a fish, what is a whale? We're targeting our C-suite or our high level positions. We're going after the big ones. I'm pretty sure that's a casino term just to say I'm going after the whales inside of your organization. Usually I want creds. I want access to something or I want your money. Their email is designed to look like from someone who you know. And they might ask you to just do a thing. Right? Uh, hey, can you click this website? Uh, my favorite, you know, fishes and whales you get these days are, are things like uh, help tag girls in the holiday photo. That is like a 100% success rate spearfish. The other one is, can you believe these guys at this party last week, blah, blah, blah. It's always like everyone wants to go and tag everyone and let them know who they know and how important they are. Um, maybe part of your job, but it may also be a little bit different from the norm. But it's spoofed information, but it doesn't really cause a concern for you. You may be asking yourself, thanks for describing spearfishing to me. Cannot believe I paid all this money to come to New Orleans and sit here for an hour and uh, watch you talk about spearfishing. It's not exactly fish, fish, spearfishing. It's a sharper spear. It's very, very targeted. And we deal with all of the Nigerian prince, lottery winnings, grandma, really bad grammar, targeted towards the uneducated type of email that you go after. They're a very, very specific set of ingredients inside of this scam. Number one, they're smaller businesses. I'm not going to say a company like Google doesn't get these emails, but they're definitely not the top of the target list, number one. Number two, you need an incorrect domain. Spearfish has come from every single thing you can think of. Anyone can spam from anywhere. But I need to have something different. I need a CEO name and I need a CFO name. And I also need some random person in some sort of accounting function who doesn't want to piss off the boss. So I need to do a little bit of homework ahead of time before I can construct these. And you can see the homework being done as well. So to get started, let's take a look at, at our second ingredient. Anyone know the difference between these two? What's that? There's a space. Any other thoughts? It's actually not a space. It's a font change, and it's a one instead of an I. So it looks like a space, number one. However, you can't have a domain name with a space in it. So this is actually a legit email or a legit domain that would go through to the untrained I, right? which we are not. We're trained I's. This makes sense to us. We can see the difference. We can see the transposition of the change of letters to numbers. Anyone catch that one as soon as it popped up? Whiskey versus Viva Whiskey. And then all I need to do is add an info, a biz, a co, an Etsy. Does anyone here know the full scope of domains that one of their clients or that their company has? I mean, have you registered infos and bizes? From a spoofing or a legitimate spoofing point of view, are you aware of what else the portfolio is? Because now there's so many TLDs that it's really hard to keep up. But guess what? This group of folks, the ones who make all the decisions, the ones who handle all the money, the ones who approve our ridiculously tiny InfoSec budgets, they are not trained eyes. They do not know what to look for. And your attackers are banking on that. They're banking on these people looking at email and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, do whatever, just go through. It's, I've heard some people call them the yes crowd. It's like everyone's, yeah, yeah, just shut up. I want to run the program. Just go through. This is probably the same people who, back to Dave's talk, would just, yeah, just open it. I don't care. Let's go. Let's go. I, I legitimately have work to do. Number two, we also need a website. How can I acquire one of these domains? How can I register m1crisoft.com? Well, in most cases that we see with this type of attack vector, Vistaprint is the purveyor. Anyone here use Vistaprint or used it before? There we go. All right. <laughs> We're gonna get, we might even see the photo of some people who've, who've been doing that for you. Um, in 90% of cases, Vistaprint is the purveyor. Why? Number one, you can set up an account with a valid credit card. It's a one month free trial, but there is no uh, activation, no any sort of charge, not even a penny to validate it whatsoever. So all you need is something that passes a LUN check, which is I think what Vistaprint does on the back end. They're even super proud, and if you go right to vistaprint.com, one of the first banners you see is try one month for free. If I've already done all my homework, I know your CEO, your CFO, I know which the controller or the accounting person to hit, I don't need a month. I need, and we'll talk a little bit about what the time frame I need is, but I can easily get it within a couple of days. 
It's really like candy on Halloween. It's very, very easy for attackers to just abuse the service, which we obviously see them doing. Um, I'm not going to rewrite the, or I'm not going to recreate the entire wheel. Uh, Ronnie Takazowski, who works for FishMe, has actually got an awesome post on, uh, he actually walks through registering a domain and what that looks like and how easy it is and just how completely charge free and free it actually is to do. So I'd recommend checking that out if, if you're interested in, you know, having a source to register a website with no charges whatsoever that you can drop within 29 days. No, I, I'm not sure how they deal with February. But there's a couple examples. So Vistaprint, there's actually a website, vistaprint.tk, that hosts a file called latest.json. And at that point in time, it is the last 24 hours of every domain registered with Vistaprint. I actually got a, I got a box back. It's the Raspberry Pi I had nothing else to do with. So I have it just every 24 hours just scraping this down and then doing some analysis on some of these domains. I pulled a couple of uh, samples out here. I don't know if they're going to be the easiest to read on the screen. But long story short, we've got a company here called Talent Gurus. Someone registered the website talentgurus, talentgurus.net with an I between the final U and the S. And they also set up a hosted email account for it as well. So if you've got something like Mark Monitor or some sort of domain service that's registering domains for you just so that attackers don't squat, why are they also registering a webmail service with it as well? You don't need to have that. Now, there may be a, may be a default setup done by Vistaprint, but in any event, you don't need that for the legitimate service. Number two, Mark Monitor doesn't use Vistaprint to register domains. Let's take a look at another one here. Uh, Bucktard Compression, by the way, if either of these companies anyone works at, I apologize, this was not intentional. Um, someone registered Bucktard Compression with the final zero, actually, or sorry, final O as, a, as the numeric zero. So at some point, in again, set up with, with, uh, with webmail. Now again, maybe someone looking to prevent squatting, but very, very suspicious to see this type of activity happening, again, with the corresponding webmail. But while we're talking about webmail, talking about how attackers use this, any thoughts on this email? I'll give you guys like three or four seconds. Anyone, anyone notice anything suspicious about this at all? And don't say it's not an actual email. I tried to make it look the best I could. Number one, this is not an actual forward. It looks like it. Anyone here use Outlook? Three chains into a forward string and it starts to turn all courier new. This looks like an actual forward. This is what people are expecting to see. This is what your attackers are expecting you to think. Oh gosh, so and so has just forwarded this. Anyone here have anyone in the organization who's like the forward or reply all king? Yeah, those guys get targeted a lot. And you all know who I'm seeing some live. You know who I'm talking about. There's one dude who just, if there wasn't a reply all button, he would not send an email. Did anyone catch this at the top? Acme ABC and Acme ACB? It slips by really, really quickly because you're not looking at the from and the to when you first think about something suspicious. Social engineering training doesn't necessarily say, hey, make sure you check these things out first. Is it from a legitimate person? If you've got an email or you're using something that accepts outward and doesn't give you any sort of internal or external notification on your subject lines, you're not really going to be paying attention to that. What else do we have? It's 4.56 p.m. on a Friday at the end of the month. Guess what that accounting person wants to do right now? Go home and not respond to any more emails. They're done. They're completely tired. They want to go home, they want to be finished with this quarter or this month, and they want to move on and get on with their life. There is a reason that emails come in at that time. This email is made to look like it's from Jim, who, oh sorry, it's from Jim sent to Jane, and then Jane forwarded it on to John and said, hey, Jim's out, can you please take care of this transfer real quick? Look at what else we've got. We've also got a PDF. This is where as a responder, as an investigator, I start to get really, really interested. I'm like, all right, finally an artifact that's not just convoluted email headers. Email header analysis is, my gosh, such a pain, but it can be super useful. So we've just taken what was a really, really simple email, and I forgot to highlight, too, there's one that always sticks out. I see if anyone catches it. There's always the grammatical errors as well, like the double space between the have and the a. Good weekend. But it's really, really easy. Anyone can think of how an attacker would get around that, of how that would not seem suspicious anymore? All I have to throw at the bottom of that email is sent from my iPhone. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, she's writing it on her iPhone. She probably made a grammatical mistake. That's what average people think would happen. They're like, oh, yeah, I double tap the space. I'm busy. I don't have time to go back. I'm already home because I'm a boss. You're still at the office because you're not. So do this thing for me real quick. So let's take a look at our PDF at what's inside. Really, really interesting stuff. We get a bank name. We get a company name. We get an account number and a routing number. And then we also get who we should be crediting this to. Is this normally how a business receives wiring instructions? Does anyone receive wiring instructions this way? I didn't think so. Uh, this is not normally how this type of stuff is sent through. So what's our first kind of preventative step? What's our first measure? Hey, accounting department, 
I know you guys aren't InfoSec. I know you're not super, super IT talented and whatnot. But if you receive wiring instructions that come in the form of a PDF that looks like it was written in Word pa WordPad and then converted to PDF real quick, you might want to just throw up a flag real quick. But what do people do instead? I don't want to piss off the boss. I don't want to piss off the CEO. I don't want to piss off the CFO. So I, I'm just going to send this thing through. And they're banking on that. They're banking on that intelligence to happen. But let's move a little bit past the deficiencies. Again, it's easy to complain. It's much better to start to turn around and fix it. Let's take a look at some of these indicators. And this is where, as an investigator, I got to have a lot of fun and start to build out the metadata of this attack group. So number one, let's talk about our situation. We've got a company that just lost 150 grand. Counting's in trouble. Bills aren't being paid. Productivity's lost. How do we take this bad situation and as investigators or as red teamers, as blue teamers, how do we have a little bit of fun with it? Well, we know this, right? We easily know this. We can figure it out. We deal in puzzles on a daily basis. There's a way that we can fix this. So let's start with our artifacts. We have a domain. Anyone here think that domain is going to be of any use? It's going to be anonymously registered through Vistaprint with a stolen credit card. There's not really much I'm going to get out of that. We have a PDF. Any use from the PDF? Anyone think of any properties of a PDF that maybe would be really, really useful. I'm going to start with an author, right? Anyone here uh, have a window? Anyone here use Windows? Okay, all right. I'm getting some hands up. Someone's awake. That's good. Um, when you register Windows, what is one of the first things it asks you for? Your name. When you install any application going forward that has any sort of signature tagging, guess what name it pulls and adds into that? The name that you gave at the very beginning, unless you go in and change it or remove it. So guess what? The name that you gave at the beginning is the name that it's going to pull. We've got a title. We've got an MD5. Is the MD5 going to be of any use? Not really. It's a single PDF that was sent to one company. We've got machine information. We've got timestamps. And we've also got banking information. So we've got a lot of artifacts from a tiny little somewhat useless PDF that we can actually start to extrapolate on. Other thoughts for the business. Do we normally work with this bank? Do we normally work with Bank of America in Durham, North Carolina at 404 Buxton Drive, which I hope is a really, address, a really good address because that would be a great bank not found kind of thing. Um, does this information match expected financial details? Do we expect to see this type of information? And does the vendor look familiar? Do you even do business with R&R &R engraving? That's for the business. You know, There's lots of business considerations for you to think about. For us, for InfoSec, let's just have some freaking fun with this stuff. So let's lay the foundation. What does information security training teach people about PDF files? PDFs are bad. They're really, really bad. Be very careful. Don't run anything. So what do people do with PDFs then? They upload them to malware.com and they upload them to VirusTotal and everyone says, oh, okay, this PDF's safe, therefore I can open it. I don't understand how we got past the content part and just said, oh, if there's no malware inside, it's a safe PDF. All I need is text to confuse you. So let's take that and let's use it to our advantage. Let's take these open, I'm, I'm going to call them open source sites. You obviously can't get the source code for VirusTotal, but you can use it freely if you'd like. Let's start with our metadata. So remember I talked a little bit about those fields that you have embedded inside of a PDF. I'm going to start with the author. So in this case, we've got an author whose name or who goes by the name Boss Lob. Um, I don't know what that is supposed to mean. I'm assuming he thinks highly of himself and he's probably quite vain. Um, and we've also got timestamps from it as well. Uh, this, the timestamps aren't going to mean much at the moment only because they're so far back, but they do correspond to very closely when we saw the breach happen. So I'm going to take that and say, all right, I've got one PDF. What else has Boss Law done? Because this is a field that is dumped in strings and is tracked by some of these open source sites. 17 different results for Boss Law. So now I'm starting to build out Boss Law's PDF portfolio of what he was creating and what he was designing as he was writing all of his fishes over time. I can start to, number one, I can start to track all the little details we talked about earlier. What companies is he using? What banks is he going from? Here's some examples. We've got companies like R&R &R Engraving, Oriental Wiring, CPL Wiring, uh, Ricker Wiring, Sparta Wiring. He really, really likes wiring uh, as, as a term. So knowing that, knowing what we know, can we assume that Bosslod works alone? Can we assume that $2.3 billion is stolen by one guy with a Mac and a PDF creator? Most likely not. Can anyone think of any other terms we could look for? I kind of gave you a little hint back here. Someone said it out loud. What's that? How about wi exactly wiring instructions? So let's start to look for wiring instructions. What else can we find on these sites that has the name wiring instructions? So what I'm doing now is I'm identifying how this attack group works, and I'm starting to build out a profile of not only the author, but also how they may name their documents as well. So let's take a look at malware. I focus on malware a lot just because VirusTotal sometimes gets a little funny. 
Malware has 55 results of PDF files or with wiring instructions inside. Now note, these types of searches can very, very quickly spin off the rails and extrapolate out of control. So remember to keep your focus on the documents that you're looking at. You're focused on PDFs, you're focused on what look like wiring instructions, you're focused on kind of weird random names. Like we've got things in here, Autolite Limited, again, Oriental Wiring shows up. Now we've got Hong Kong Wealth Incorporated. So what did we find? What did we find as we went through this research and as we started to map this out? I did this in about half an hour. Here's a zoomed out view. Red is authors, yellow is documents, Green is banks that they were using. Anyone see any choke points? Banks obviously are the easiest ones. But look at the number of documents that these authors have put together. This is insane. So now what are we doing? We're building out what this group, I don't want to say gang, but there's been some news articles that refer to them as a gang, uh, that, that we start to build out what this gang looks like, what they're, the things that they're building out. We also get additional authors from all this information as well. We passed the stage of boss law now. Now look at these names. Compaq. Houdini, Ray, Kills with a Z, and also Colvis and Mew. Colvis and Mew is great because he put his entire full name in all these documents. Colvis actually likes to target individuals as well. We see that in some of the PDF creations. So without, again, letting this spin out too far of control, each one of these now becomes a search term for all my different sites. I use VirusTotal and Malware as examples because they're A, accessible and easy to use, but if anyone's got proprietary sources or you've got a good API, your searches can be even more extensive and, and even deeper and hopefully find more artifacts. What else did we find? We found the banks that they like to use as well. HSBC, Bank of America, these aren't necessarily foreign banks to anyone. HSBC is a massive multi-billion dollar com uh, corporation. However, does my company normally do business with HSBC? So if I'm, an, if I'm a blue teamer and I'm trying to find a way to protect my organization from this type of attack, I want to know things like this because I want to tell the accounting team what types of banks do we normally work with. Do we work with these banks? If we do, then we need to wrap controls around them. We understand what our attackers like, where they like to park their money. Let's make sure we're not parking money there as well. And if we are, let's make sure we understand what we're doing with money that's parked there. We only have two accounts at HSBC, for example. Outside of those two, I'm not interested in transfers. Some banks are only used once, and I apologize, maybe a little hard to read on the screen there, but we've got some banks that are only used once. That makes us ask some other questions as well. Why are they only using them once? HSBC is used multiple times. Why are some like uh, China Citizens Bank only used once? Are the attackers testing out? Did the mule fail? Did the mule get arrested on their way there? But again, it's a key data point that we want to know about because it stands out. It's anomalous to our normal accounting behavior. Again, it was about 20, I would say 20, 30 minutes of research. The last 10 was mostly entering all this kind of stuff. We got hundreds of results. We built out a massive dashboard of tons of PDFs. We were able to, to take the campaign a little bit larger, actually. If you, I spent a couple hours fully building it out and doing every single search I could think of, and it just got larger and larger and larger to the point where I was like, all right, I need to stop because I'm just going to spend forever on this. $2.3 billion. It's a lot of documents that come through. So it was a lot of fun building out this profile, but I think what I really wanted to make sure we focus on is the tools to track, profile, and visualize. As we're blue teamers, as we're starting to defend these networks, I need something inside of my network that helps me protect and research and access my information a lot better. So I'm just going to start by saying this. If you're working in InfoSec and you're not keeping notes on previous engagements, adversaries, malware, suspicious activity, whatever it is, I hate this phrase, you're doing it wrong. I hate it, but it works. You need to be keeping notes. You need to be finding ways to keep data from point to point to point. InfraSec is cumulative. It is, that's why we have versioning. It's not everything version 1.0 and we're just going to release something new. We get better as time goes on. We can't be resetting the clock as defenders. Red teamers, I think, uh, and especially consultants, but red teamers have it a little bit easier. Every single company is different. Let me start over and find something new. Blue teamers, you have to continually be growing and learning. Um, the vulnerability, I see a lot of vulnerability reports in my job and the number of vulnerability reports where it's like two, three, four years old, and every year it's the same vulnerability over and over again. You have to cumulatively be getting better at this. That being said, if you are looking at doing threat intelligence, this is all you need. Um, just get yourself a pew pew map, a 70 inch monitor inside of your lab, and you're good to go. That's it. Honestly, just kidding. This is probably the worst type of threat intel that there is. If you are running a small company in New Orleans, China attacking England has nothing to do with you whatsoever. In fact, it's probably not even an attack. It's just IP-based correlation that some companies spent all of their money on. Anyone here from Norse? OK, good. All of their money on visualization and not on actual products. <clears throat> but how can we start? Let's start really, really basic. One of the best note-taking tools is Notepad. 
There's nothing wrong with handing over to the person coming after you or the guy taking the shift over a text file with your notes from that. It's always funny. I, uh, I, I, a lot of movies that you watch, anyone here watch any like pirate movies or old style like, uh, you know, explorer movies or anything like that, they always have these things called captain's logs. And it's always like the most, it's always the narration of the story. It's like captain's logs. Today, uh, you know, John Smith almost fell overboard because he was chasing a seagull or something like that. It's like, it's so trivial. But if I was taking over from the captain, I'd want to know why John's leg is broken. You know, and that little tiny detail helps me know that. So keep notes. You can upgrade your game a little bit if you want. Go Notepad plus plus. You could even go back to old school and just do diary, journal, and pens and paper. As long as you're keeping notes. If you're not keeping notes right now, start with something. The simplest form is better than nothing. Um, always include enough information that if you read it again, you would remember the event fully. So that actually kind of plays into report writing as well. Um, every single artifact should stand on its own. Every statement should be a full sentence. Uh, you should be able to reread a page a year later and be like, oh, I remember what happened in that incident. I remember it because this just refreshed me, not because I uh, had to recall a bunch of stuff. I'll remember this works 0% of the time. Has anyone here said I'll remember this 100% of the time they remember to do that exact thing? I did not think so. No one ever, if you do do that, you definitely deserve some sort of a global award. Um, I also, I hate, again, I hate this analogy, hit by a bus, but it's a very good strategy that works. If you are the sole keeper of some sort of key in your environment, some sort of threat intel in your environment, and you were to not show up tomorrow, and the company got attacked tomorrow, and it happened to be the apocalypse of sick days and incident response, would your company drown? If they do, you're doing your job wrong. You should be able to, and again, you may be the most elite person on your team, but you still need to equip others around you to be able to act without you there. You can really step your game up a little bit and go to spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are really, really good threat intel because they give obvious correlation. You can look at a spreadsheet and immediately say, oh, okay, this row and this column match up. We're all trained, I think, through various methods of school and websites to look at a table and understand exactly what's happening. It allows you to main relational data. Naked Eye can also find patterns and inconsistencies. Much better. There is no AI machine in the world I've ever experienced, ever read about, ever seen, ever demoed that can beat me at identifying patterns. Anyone here ever done any sort of malware string analysis? Or anyone here done any type of malware analysis? How much malware analysis is running something and then just scrolling? Because you're looking for patterns. There's no AI machine that can say, oh, hey, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but this alphabet decreases and increases in letters as you go down. I can only see that just by looking through it. Your naked eye can see a lot better, and you're going to pick up patterns a lot faster. So find a way to maintain data in a way that lets you find these patterns. Um, there's an example of a spreadsheet. Again, it may be a little bit hard to read. What's one of the first things you notice when you look at that table right there? There's two empty cells. If this is the indicator source tracking from my entire organization, why are there two cells missing? Did someone forget to record them? Do we not have them? Do we not get that file? Was that not available that day? What is going on? Immediately, you're looking for things that need to be improved. We can also take a look and start to see similarities between things. Do these hashes line up? I can do sorts. I can do different types of relation data mapping. But what makes spreadsheets even more baller is visualization. Anyone here use Maltigo before? Awesome tool. The case file actually just became completely available. You don't have to do community anymore um, recently. So I'd highly recommend using this if you're into visualization. However, manual Maltigo entry sucks. I hate sitting there and right-click typing, right-click typing, right-click typing. However, CSV to Maltigo, really, really easy. Remember this guy, this little table that you're tracking? Throw that guy into Maltigo real quick, and it's going to pop out with a, with a graph, some sort of visualization. This right here, anyone ever present to a C-suite? C-suites want to see that graph at the bottom. And you can say them pretty things like, oh, red is the number of attackers, yellow is the number of documents, and green is the number of banks. And it's like, oh, OK, I totally get it. There's a lot of shit going on. I should pay attention to this now. They'll wake up, and all of a sudden, those people who make the decisions on all the money. But visualization not only helps us portray it better, it lets us speak to other departments as well. Let's us find those choke points. Let's us talk to our data scientists who may be on our organization. Hey, help me find where we can tweak our processes in here. Help me find the things to look for. There's also really great threat tracking platforms out there as well. Um, I actually, there's quite a few screenshots in here of a tool called ThreatNote. Um, it's written by uh, Brian Wareheim. I might be mispronouncing Brian's last name. I, I usually say it different ways every single time. Um, it allows you to track indicators of many different types. Um, MD5s, IP addresses, threat actors. It's an awesome tool, uh, completely free and open source. It gets better every single day. He integrates it with tons and tons of uh, tools out there. Um, I'd highly recommend if you're looking for a way to track threats in your environment, you're looking for something that helps you just keep track of everything that comes through, I would definitely recommend uh, checking this out. 
Uh, also make sure as you're keeping track of these threats and as you're profiling things that are coming into your organization as well, make sure you're not keeping track of the noise and labeling it as a true positive. And to, be that, and to the flip side of that, make sure you're not throwing true positives in with blankets as well. Some threat intel reports come out and you get 100 MD5s in them. If you've got one MD5 hit in your environment, that does not mean you have that APT threat actor in your environment. It may mean that they use a variation of some sort of scanning tool that happens to be in there as well. So from a list of 100, I've got one MD5 that's an actual indicator for me and 99 that are completely false positive. So don't pollute your own threat intel source that unfortunately may steer you in the wrong direction. APIs are your friend as well. Um, APIs can be used to enrich your data to provide more context. Now note, and I know this is going to sound really funny coming from a Mandiant guy, China is not threat intel, nor is an indication of an IP address coming from China. That does not mean you are being attacked by the Chinese. It simply means that a computer connected to another computer and one of the IPs of that computer was in China. That's all it means. Don't get hung up on paid versus unpaid either. All the research that we did in here, I built out a $2.3 billion gang campaign, and I did it all with open source tools on the internet in a matter of hours. There is no paid tool that would have helped with that whatsoever. Maybe it would have made my searches faster. Maybe I could have done a command line search as opposed to using the web browser, but doesn't necessarily mean I was unable to do my job. Don't get hung up on the paid versus the unpaid, but do get hung up on the value that it provides. I'm going to look at malware now. Malware is not a threat intelligence source whatsoever. They do not claim to be. It is online cuckoo sandbox. That's all it is. But what did I get out of malware? I, again, I built out a campaign. I built out a profile. So find ways to use these tools that are readily available to you and find ways to take data out of them that can actually help you as opposed to, nah, it's useless. It doesn't mean anything for me whatsoever. Now, that being said, I have to give an important disclaimer. If you do find brand new malware in your environment, please don't upload it. Please don't. Uh, I had to work a breach. It was at a bank a couple years ago. And um, not only was the bank extremely targeted and under an active attack, but they also did not want to work with us as consultants whatsoever. The only way we found out the attack was still going on was by refreshing virus total string searches because they would get malware and upload it to virus total. So every 15 minutes, the attackers would deploy new malware, you know, create a new MD5. The security team would find it, they would upload it to virus total, and then they would go and block that MD5. They did this for about three hours before finally I came back and I said, hey guys, look, we've been watching you for three hours do all this just by watching Virus Total. You're obviously not going to win if you're just going to keep uploading. Because guess what the attackers were doing? F5 in the exact same page we're looking at as well. So they're just waiting to see it come through. That being said, how do we start to get better? We know there's a massive campaign out there. We were able to build out indicators. We are able to build out a profile of what these attackers look like. We are able to build out a profile of how they work, of what may be coming into my organization. So, number one, will expensive ass malware detonation device help me? No, not at all. Zero day prevention banner you saw at RSA will be useless in this case because it is just a PDF of text. There's nothing in there that's going to trigger anything whatsoever. Unless you're doing some sort of crazy OCR and you're looking for bank account information inside of PDFs, in which case more power to you. Will expensive ass threat intelligence help? Is any threat intelligence service here going to tell you Hey, by the way, we spoke to some dudes in Nigeria. You are going to get fished next month. Uh, so keep an eye out for it. No, no one is going to be able to do that. Um, how do you know when you're going to get hit? You don't. So we have to get a little bit better. Will a malware only focus help? I think Dave made a really good point earlier, and, and I, I wish I, I, I could have said it first, but um, unfortunately, he usually says it better. Uh, zero days are super, super sexy. Any red teamers in the room? How many zero days have you used to break into an environment? Not, not commercially. So for paid, for paid engagements, you don't need zero days. Again, why are we focusing all of our activity on, oh my gosh, did you guys see that talk at Black Hat? We need to make sure we're defending against this super, super elite exploit that was developed in a lab by a bunch of students who have no jobs and lots of time. And if we're not defending against this, our organization is going to be at risk. No problem. Anyone here give any information security training to the accounting department? Again, $2.3 billion being stolen. Look in your environment and think about where your weakest links actually are. Again, I hate coming back to the old adage of people, 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 people. Our people aren't trained, so therefore they're getting in. That's, you know, there's a lot of exploitable code out there. You're right. There's a lot of weaknesses found. And yes, there was recently a security company who was found to be running Apache as root, and that allowed for a couple exploits, and it turned into a massive, disgusting legal situation. Can't comment on that. But in any event, Yes, there's a lot of crap out there that happens and that puts people in bad or uh, bad situations. However, start with start internally. Start with your people. Again, if your job is to protect your house, then look at your house and say, where am I actually vulnerable in here? 
Are you going to patch every single web server in the world? Are you going to get complete security control over the development team? No. They don't care. They want everything open. They want everything to be by default so they can write easy scripts and they want APIs to be as simple as possible. What else should we be doing to get better? We should be sharing this information. Sharing is actually caring. I like this. This is a very sentimental slide. Probably because of the puppy dogs carrying a stick on there together. Something as prolific as 800 million, again, now we're up to 2.3 billion, should not be news. It should not be the first time you hear about a multi-billion dollar global email scam. The first time you get hit should not be the first time you hear about it. We need to be paying attention to what goes on out there. Again, is a small organization going to see the same threats as Citibank or as Google or as Apple or as Facebook? No, they're not. So don't act like you're going to as well. And that's not to be demeaning to anyone. It's focus on what you're actually going to be targeted with. What's actually going to be coming after you? What's actually going to be com coming for you? Krebs should not be your IDS. It's like this joke that started. I don't know if it was Swift on Secure. I don't know how that got started, but someone came up with the phrase of Brian Krebs is my IDS, and it got turned to like t-shirts and bumper stickers and that kind of stuff. Guys, a, a, an international press release about your faults should not be your IDS. I know it's meant in jest, but at the same time, it should really be your goal is to avoid that. And it's funny, too. Now, I've, I've worked on a lot of financially motivated cases, and people are like, oh, we need to get all this done before Krebs reports us. I'm like, that, that, that's your motivation for finding an attacker and stopping fraud in your environment so that Brian Krebs doesn't tweet your name out there? We need to be a little more concerned with what's actually going on here. Not only is sharing caring and avoiding Krebs is my IDS, we should also not be embarrassed to admit what happened as well. Now, blanket statement here. I am not asking any company to give out any proprietary information. But it is OK to say you've been spearfished. It is OK to say where you were touched on the doll. It's all right. We are all being targeted, every single one of us in some way, shape, or form, whether it's 10,000 Nigerian prince emails a day or whether it's someone coming after my C-suite because they want to steal X amount of dollars from my environment, we're all being targeted. It's okay to admit increases and decreases in new campaigns. It's okay to share those with others. Um, is anyone here doing any sort of industry-based or collective threat intel sharing? I don't mean you signed up for Threat Connect or anything. Is anyone here doing any sort of cross-company industry sharing? See, there's ways for us to set up and share indicators between our organizations and say, hey, uh, other people who are in the small to medium-sized uh, you know, oil and gas business in the New Orleans area, we just got fish and we just lost $250,000. Here's what we learned. Here's what you guys should be looking out for. It's okay to share those types of details. It's not embarrassing. It's embarrassing when you get hit again and again and again and again. It's embarrassing when Krebs tweets about you. It's embarrassing when the FBI uses your name as the case study for this story. It's not embarrassing to call up someone that you really play golf with every weekend and just say, hey, by the way, we got attacked. You should know about this. And it's okay to share indicators. Here's the PDFs. Here's the names. Here's the bank accounts. Get your accounting department up. We can all start to collectively raise this up a little bit. So not only are we sharing, now we've got a way to track and share as well. We have tools. We have platforms. There was definitely a period of time when it was very, very difficult to maintain a comprehensible set of indicators. It's very difficult to maintain actionable intelligence in my environment. Those tools now exist, and they're free, and they're open source, and they're darn easy to install. Uh, anyone here not run a Python setup.py? All right, you can all install Threat, uh, threat Connect. Uh, sorry, not Threat Connect. You can all install Threat Intelligence Platforms. Very, very open source, very, very simple. And last but not least, I think one of the most important considerations, your organization is not expecting you, they're not asking you to become a threat intelligence expert. If anyone here signed a contract that says line one, you will be a threat intelligence expert, go back and renegotiate it. You're going to have a really, really tough time with that. No one's asking you to do that, but you are being asked to protect an organization. So again, focus on what you're actually being asked to do. Focus your your research on that, focus your indicators on that, focus your tracking on that, and you're going to find yourself a lot more successful. And again, I hope no one in this room has been hit by this scam. But if you have, think of ways that your organization can grow and learn from that. And kind of as a little encore part, sometimes it does get better. Us blue teamers, it's really, really frustrating to put together an entire case. Anyone here ever lost a case to the FBI? OK, oh, you're all very, very lucky then. Uh, I did an investigation a few years ago. It actually turned out to be APT1, and I now work for Mannion, who released all that. But we were about three months into a massive investigation of a huge engineering company. And uh, we got all the way through, got the report written, got this beautiful analysis done. We had this, you know, like the whiteboard thing. It looks like CSI cyber inside of there. That's how legit we were. Um, and it's just crap everywhere, pins up, red string, all this kind of stuff. We had the whole thing mapped out from soup to nuts. And uh, I came in one Monday morning, and it was all gone. 
all taken away. And I was like, I went to my, my boss at the time and I said, hey, um, <laughs> that's like six months of research and analysis and an active investigation and an active attacker, what the hell happened? And they're like, oh yeah, the FBI came in and took over the case. So we're officially done, go find another engagement to work on. Just like that, Monday morning, done. Thanks a lot. I was really, really upset at the time, but you know, you get over things. And then something cool like this happens. Anyone remember the name Colvis MU that we found inside of our PDFs? Guess what, in January 2016, Colvis got arrested. So all of this intel that we had used actually turned into something. I, I worked probably about 10 to 15 of the cases that uh, they were across multiple different states, but I was able to help put together the case that the FBI eventually actually, some of our report text became what they put in the final press release, which was kind of fun, but it does get better. Um, I know sometimes it seems very, very futile to go through all this. You lose tons of money, you spend hours, you lose a lot of sleep, your family misses you, all this kind of stuff, and you're like, ah, this was just a little fraud case. But sometimes it does get better. Sometimes we don't just have an indictment of eight Chinese people and then it just gets left at that, um, which is a funny joke unto itself. Um, but in any event, he's now sitting in custody in Dallas. I kind of want to go visit him because he's, he's where I live and I just want to be like, hey, um, so I'm doing this research and I'd love to know kind of before it happened, you know, how'd you guys talk about this? But um, I doubt he'd probably give me any information. But in any event, uh, it was nice to see a lot of this research actually come to fruition and then someone to say, oh yeah, we arrested this guy who's uh, stolen somewhere in the vicinity of, I think he was responsible for about 20 to 30 million himself. Um, so he's looking at like 30 years in jail and fines and all that kind of stuff. So again, there's sometimes a light at the end of the tunnel and then the, there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. With that, that brings me to the end of this. Uh, thank you very much to number one, everyone attending. Uh, it's really, really hard to complain about being at a conference in New Orleans. It's so beautiful here. And thanks to everyone who uh, helped out with the tools as well that I mentioned. With that, I'd love to take any questions if there are any and thank you again. All right, silence and golden. <laughs>